Everyone in town knows the story of Gerald's department store. Duncan Gerald opened the place in the late 40s to try and civilize us country bumpkins with overpriced clothes and things from the East Coast. Or Los Angeles, or wherever. Five floors tall, with huge open spaces to be filled with junk no one needed, and no one wanted. Everyone said the place wouldn't last a year in such a small town, no matter what Mr. Gerald said to the contrary. Everyone was right, but for the worse reasons. Days before the grand opening, several bodies were found on the fifth floor of the department store. The stories vary on when, how many, and even how many bodies were found. Depending on who's telling it, they either killed themselves or were killed in some freaky satanic ritual. The place closed up and left everything exactly where it stood including the banner meant for some ribbon-cutting ceremony. The lights never went out in the place, always humming away on the first floor, illuminating a showroom of dart, deco, furniture, and art. Since then, people like to talk about how the place is wrong somehow. The first floor is well lit, clean as the day it closed up and can be seen through floor to ceiling and wall-to-wall -wall windows across the storefront. Every other floor is dark, even when the sun is shining straight at the building. No one's sure why the lights are still on or why, but the city never discusses shutting them off, citing that it's a good deterrent to people breaking into the building. That didn't stop Archer me, or the dozens of people who had probably broken into the place since Mr. Gerald locked the front doors to the department store, but left one of the loading bay doors cracked just enough to let someone squeeze through. Archer had practically forced me into exploring the place. Using all of those words teenage guys like to use to get their friends to do something all of them know is stupid, but want to do anyway. A couple other guys said they'd go to, but when I arrived, it was just Archer and I waiting there. A lot of swearing and shimmying later, both of us sat in the dark loading docks of the department store, panting from me having to pull Archer through the gap after he got stuck. He wanted to rush to the stairs and talked about everything we could do to get onto the second floor before anyone saw us and called the cops. But stepping out into the showroom... Both of us stopped in our tracks. Seeing the place from the outside is extremely different from walking through a room filled with perfectly preserved furniture as old as my grandparents. Hearing the quiet sounds of some music in the background, a song that seemed vaguely familiar but not quite right. Offbeat, maybe. I shook off the feelings as Archer punched me in the arm, and we climbed the back staircase to the second floor. About half of the lights glue across what should have been a darkened second floor. Everything in the place was old, molding and covered in dust. From the floor to the racks of formerly fashionable clothes set into neat and orderly rows. Faded signs declaring, Fresh from New York and West Coast fashion brought to you. Hung from fraying lines or lay in heaps on the floor. I was going to suggest turning around, going home before we got caught, but Archer turned to me, and the words died on my lips. Eyes shining in the dim light, I could see a look that said it all. He was going to the top floor no matter what. Nothing I said or tried to do would dissuade him from his great adventure. So that left two options. Go with him, or not. I gritted my teeth and followed Archer up into the gloom. It was somehow colder here than the first floor, like the heat only worked below us. I danced around the old signs and ribbons hanging from the ceiling, but Archer just bowled right through them, throwing clouds of dust and mold up into the air, leaving me hacking and wheezing behind him. The music was quieter here, but still there and still off. 
As we approached the next flight of stairs, I saw the first indication we weren't the first people to try this climb. Graffiti. It was in handwriting kind of like the kind you see in a bathroom stall. Small and hard to read. You have to cut them down. I pointed the words out and Archer got a weird look on his face. Far away and thoughtful. I stood in silence as he seemed to work the words out in his head. Finally, he responded in a small, distant voice. I know you can't cut them down. What? What does that mean? I asked back, confused and getting a little freaked out by the whole thing. Archer just looked at me blankly, not seeming to understand what I meant. Okay. Archer, I think we should head back down and get out of here. This place isn't safe and you're being weird. Still that blank stare. Then he just turned and started up the stairs to the third floor. I obviously couldn't leave him on his own. Not the way he was acting. So I clenched my jaw until it hurt and followed him up the stairs. There were no lights working on the third floor. Instead, the third floor was colder than the second floor and reeked of mold and rot. I fumbled for the flashlight tucked into my hoodie pocket and switched it on. The light did nothing to help the creeping feeling of dread I felt as I panned the flashlight's beam across the room. The floor might have been the jewelry floor or maybe where they sold perfume and makeup. Smashed glass cases made uneven rows and squares around the room. Sitting on top of floorboards soaked in water for years, at least. Mold grew up the walls and mushrooms sat in patches between the rotting sections of carpet. It felt larger somehow, too. I could see the walls when I was pointing the flashlight at them. But when I wasn't, the walls seemed to retreat away from me. I couldn't see Archer anywhere around me, so... I began carefully picking my way through the sharp glass shards and rot sweeping the room for him. Graffiti covered the parts of the walls not encrusted in mold. Never anything different. Just the same six words repeated over and over. I couldn't understand how this many different people could have written those words. Some of the words were written ten feet into the air. Others over sections of floor rotten enough I'd worry about going through them in an instant all in different handwriting and colors of paint, marker, pencil, or pen, and they all looked new. You have to cut them down. You have to cut us down. You have to cut them down. I finally found Archer next to the staircase staring emptily at the gaping dark hole above us into the fourth floor. I grabbed his shoulder and he seemed to sort of snap out of it and began to head up the stairs. I gingerly took the first step, worried it couldn't hold my weight and I'd fall through down to one of the lower floors, but it only creaked as I carefully followed Archer up the next floor. My flashlight held in hands that were starting to shake. I couldn't see more than 10 feet in front of me with the flashlight and what I could see twisted my gut. Plywood sheets lay across floors that were almost completely gone. Huge gaping holes leading down somewhere, but they couldn't be leading into the third floor. It was starting to fall apart, but there hadn't been any huge holes in the ceiling. I pointed the flashlight above me and could see the floor joists of the fifth floor easily. They were practically board-shaped chunks of rot and mold held together by hope and a prayer. I stepped out onto the first sheet, hoping that Archer wasn't too far ahead of me, but there was nothing but more plywood sheets. Archer? Archer? I tried to call out to him, but the darkness seemed to swallow my voice, and it sounded small and scared to my own ears. I was done trying to figure out what was going on with him, or with this place. Turning around to head down to the third floor, I found no staircase. 
Just more of the plywood sheets leading back into the darkness. Walking down the path back towards where the staircase should be. Still nothing. So I turned around again and retraced my steps thinking maybe I had just gotten turned around. Nothing. Nothing but more of these infinite sheets of plywood. I'm not sure how long I just sat there, waiting to see if anything changed, or if my eyes would adjust to the darkness, but eventually, I had to go somewhere. Choosing to go in what I thought was the direction I had been going before backtracking twice, I walked deeper into the floor. The path twisted and turned seemingly at random, making it hard to figure out just how far I had gone. After 15 to 20 minutes of walking, I began to see pieces of paper laying on top of the plywood. I picked a few, but they just had the same thing over and over. Can you cut us down? I still didn't know what was going on or where any of this stuff was coming from. So I dropped the pages and continued on. At first, everything was absolutely quiet. My footsteps making the only sound as they made the plywood moan and creak beneath me. I could have sworn again and again that I'd hear something. And stopped to strain, hoping that maybe I was catching up to Archer. Eventually I stopped trying to listen and just slogged my way through the dark, focusing on my footing. The staircase appeared so suddenly that I near fell over from colliding with it. Archer wasn't there waiting for me like before. Just the empty staircase leading into another empty void in the ceiling. This one was showing its age. Twisted metal steps bowed and rusty in the middle. The concrete railing along each side crumbling and covered in more of the graffiti. You have to cut us down. You have to cut us down. Holding on to the crumbling railing, I crept up the stairs to the top floor of Gerald's department store. The fifth floor was a much smaller room than I'd expected. The floor was concrete and the walls were twice the height of any of the other floors, making the room feel tall and narrow. A single bare light bulb swung slowly on its wire in the room's center creating strange shadows. Shadows shaped like people elongated and spindly. A dozen of them, maybe more, twisted in time with the light bulb as it swung around the room, lighting up words scrawled across the walls. You have to cut us down. You can't cut us down. You can't touch us. We can touch you. We can bring you up with us. The shadows began to move against the light bulb, past it, and closed on me from all sides. My flashlight did nothing to slow them. I began to back away, stumbling as I went, until my shoes hit the top of the staircase and I fell down. I don't remember anything of what happened after that, but someone had seen us sneak into the department store and called the cops. They found me at the base of the stairs of the fifth floor. My skull cracked open from hitting the ground. They found Archer, too. He had somehow hung himself on the fifth floor with the wire from the light bulb. It took weeks to heal, and more before I was able to get out from under my family's thumb long enough to get what I needed. But I didn't. And tonight, I'm burning Gerald's department store to the ground. I am what you'd call a crypto addict. Before that, though, I was someone who enjoyed browsing the deep web. I wasn't really looking for anything in particular, just curious as to whether or not the stories I had heard were true. I never really found anything that creepy, though, but it was my first encounter with Bitcoin. A few sites used it, and it was the first time I'd ever heard of the cryptocurrency. As such, though, I had thought that it was a scam or something shady at that point. 
This was back in the years 2012 to 2014, so, as you can imagine. I'm really kicking myself for thinking that and not buying a few coins myself. My interest in the deep web waned over time, but around the year 2017, I began reading about cryptocurrency and that oh-so-shady thing, Bitcoin on mainstream news outlets. That's when I made a deeper dive into the world of crypto. My goal at the beginning was just to earn enough money to pay off my student loans. Of course, nothing was ever that easy. I had made nearly every single mistake you could make while buying crypto. Once, I lost my seed phrase. I've sent crypto to the wrong wallet by mistake. I FOMO'd and sold at a loss countless times. Twice, I've been fooled by pump and dump schemes. Despite all of this, my net monetary change from buying into crypto has still been overall positive. That's mainly because I wisened up over the years and made back the money I lost and then some. Of course, every time I hear about a random coin going up 20 times in price. I do wish I would have seized the opportunity, but I know most of those coins probably don't have much value or long-term prospects. I invest in safe projects, but of course, like almost anyone else, I've been on the lookout for the next big thing. You know, the next big project that's going to the moon, so to speak. I got an email from an old acquaintance of mine. Let's call him Frank. Frank and I went back to the days when I scoured the deep web. And the two of us would often exchange information regarding anything interesting that we'd found. I hadn't gotten a message from him in two years, though, so I was kind of surprised. Hey, I know it's been a while, but I saw this weird thing and I think you'd want to check it out. I see from your profile that you've been in the crypto space for a while, right? What do you think about this? It's a site claiming to have made a new kind of coin. There was a link to a website. At first, I was really confused. This website was on the deep web, but according to this mail, was regarding a new crypto coin. That made no sense. When you made a new coin, one of the first things you wanted to do was get as many people in on the project as possible making all information about your new coin exclusive to the deep web, was a guarantee that it would probably never take off. Then again, maybe they were making some sort of super secure coin which the government couldn't trace. So they kept it on the down low. Regardless, I decided to check out the link. The website was honestly nothing to write home about. It was decently organized, but was rather plain. It looked like a web page from 2007. This was definitely the wrong thing to do if you wanted people to be interested in what you were doing, or convincing them that you had a great new idea for something. There wasn't even too much information on the site about the coin itself, with most of it linking to a video they had made. There was a forum, but accessible only to members. Guessing there was nowhere else to go, I went ahead and clicked on the video. It showed a dark room with a desk right in the middle. Someone walked in wearing a white mask and a dark hoodie. As he spoke, his voice was distorted, so he was clearly using a filter of some sort. Greetings. Thank you for your interest in our new project, one by which we hope to revolutionize the very concept of cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. I have long since been a member of the crypto space, but I consider myself to be an environmentalist first. You must have already heard about the environmental impact that mining cryptocurrency has. Many people have spoken about that. As such, we wanted to look for a way to solve this problem. A solution quickly came to me, but it was a bit of an unorthodox one. You see, I am a man of many interests, and the occult was one of them. 
One thing I had always been told was that spirits, demons, what have you, they always know everything going on in the world. They don't follow the normal laws of physics either. It was at this point I began frowning. What on earth was this? Was this guy really talking about ghosts and spirits in a crypto video? I thought that it might be possible to use this to our advantage. You see, a spirit can theoretically solve a problem in an instant. Time works different for them, and the best part is the environmental impact is nil. I was just about ready to turn this off at this point. What kept me going was a mild curiosity regarding where this guy was going. This had to be some sort of scam, right? But what was the scam? Was he going to ask for a donation first, or was he just trying to install malware on my computer? I mean, he must have made this video for a reason, right? I just wanted to know what the scam was so I could tell Frank what it was. I searched around in many books on the occult until I came upon them. They do have a name, but not one that you can speak freely in this tongue. Suffice it to say that certain supernatural creatures are willing to help us and mine our coin for us. Now, of course, you must be thinking that such a thing isn't worth your soul. Rest assured, though, that these creatures don't want our souls. Simply our bodies. I told them that, in that case, they should buy us all a round of drinks first. He chuckled at his own joke. Anyway, the idea is simple. You, as a human, can rent out your body for a small portion of the day. In exchange, these creatures will mine coins for you. That's right. I managed to connect the spirit realm with the internet so that they can mine cryptocurrency for us. Right now, we are starting out with mining Bitcoin by this method to test it out, but we'll release our own project very soon. I can say, though, that I am quite excited by the potential of our upcoming coin, as it will be mined only by these entities. All information would be held not only on the internet, but within the spirit realm as well, so... There's even if every database on Earth was wiped clean, we could recover the data. For now, though, we are just seeing how easy it is to mine Bitcoin using this method. If you're interested in renting out yourself, you can go ahead and sign the contract given on our site. If you're interested in simply buying some of our own coins when our new project will be released by conventional methods, please stay tuned for further updates. Thank you. The video ended at that and I was left confused. Making all this would have taken some cash and some time, so was it all really just a hoax? How were they planning on making money out of this? With no further information available, I checked out their forums, but that was only open to people who had signed their contract for now. I took a look at this contract. It was needlessly long and annoyed me because I knew there was no way that a site like this could ever take anyone to court if the contract was violated, so what was the point? The gist of the whole thing was that you would agree to rent out your body for a time ranging from 1 to 10 hours a day. In exchange, you would get a set amount of Bitcoin per day, with it increasing depending on how long you rented yourself out. Let's say you got X amount for an hour, and you'd get 20 times X for 10 hours. Clearly, it was designed for people to choose the maximum amount of time possible. Frustrated, I put down my selection as one hour and hit accept. A message popped up. This contract will be valid for one year and cannot be cancelled before then. Are you sure you want to accept? I scoffed at the idea of them trying to enforce this contract and hit the accept button. A congratulatory message popped up as well as an address to a wallet I could unlock. 
Disappointed, I browsed the site a bit more and saw nothing to explain what it really was. I could only chalk this all up to a very elaborate hoax. Next day, I went about my day as usual when something odd happened as I left my driveway. I found myself in my office an instant later. If I had been paying a bit more attention at the time, I would have noticed that I had lost exactly one hour. But I wasn't. I had zoned out while driving to work occasionally, but not when I was entering the building. I chalked it up to me just having a long daydream, though. Things didn't worry me. Not yet, at least. Something similar happened the next day. Though I had some trouble noticing this as it happened when I was chilling around at home and I just thought I'd lost track of time as the sky suddenly became a lot darker. The third day, though, it happened at work. I was in a meeting and then it was over and I was at my desk. On one hand, I was happy to be able to skip the meeting, but also I knew I was losing my mind. The MRIs all came back normal and the doctors thought I had dissociative identity disorder when a month later I found myself in my house with some jewelry I had no recollection of getting. I learned the next day that one of my neighbors had been mugged, but didn't know who it was. That day, I suddenly found myself in a park with a shard of glass on my shoulder. I learned that someone had smashed another neighbor's car. Fed up with this, I installed cameras around the house to watch me. And that night, I saw myself leave the house and came back later with some cash. Cash I must have stolen. Yeah, I learned someone's house had been broken into the day after that. I finally put two and two together and went back to the website. I hadn't checked my wallet, but it had a substantial amount of Bitcoin now. Clearly, this thing hadn't been a hoax. They wouldn't be paying me if they weren't getting something out of it. Whatever entity chose to inhabit my body started out by just mimicking what I normally did. But it was clear it was getting more and more daring with the theft and vandalism it was doing. I read up that long contract again and I saw no termination clause. I can't exactly communicate with this thing that takes control of me. And even if I could, I have a feeling that it doesn't want to leave. Forum posts on that site are of no help as a few people seem to be in the same boat as me but have no idea what to do. The site doesn't have a customer service section to no surprise. Based on what I've read of the contract, the entity can't hurt me or my property or do a crime that would lead to me being arrested or the such. But it can do crime as long as it makes sure that I'm not caught later on. Anyway, I highly doubt it wants me to be arrested. It would not have as much fun as when I'm free to roam around. In the end, though, I realized that I couldn't live like this. There was nothing else to do but wait for my contract to expire, so... I've moved to a very remote area where there are few people around. I'm glad for that, so that the thing can't harm anyone else. I've even had to give my dog away to my parents for the time being. I don't know if she'd count as my property, but I don't want that thing hurting her one day. I read on a forum post on that site of someone who found themselves with blood on their hands after a blackout, and that they were freaking out while wondering whose it was. It's obviously much worse for those who rented out their bodies for several hours. I guess I should be thankful I only agreed to one hour. I've quit my job and I only go out of town to get supplies when the hour is up. I thought about maybe tying myself up so I can't get out, but I'd still need to do things like go to the bathroom and that sounds like a terrible way to live. It's been three months total and there are nine left. The coins I keep getting are enough to pay my living expenses, thankfully. 
I might have had to rent myself out for longer if that wasn't the case. I'm writing this because I was curious if there's a lawyer among you who might be willing to read over the contract I agreed to. If every contract has a loophole, I'd be happy if you could find one in this one. I can't go to a regular attorney, of course, given no one would believe me. I mean, where would I even go to dispute this? But if there's someone among you who is experienced with dealing this supernatural contracts, do please contact me. If possible, I would also prefer it if you could accept payments. Bitcoin. It happened a week after my sister had gone missing, a rainy evening in late October. My mother was still setting the table for her as she was convinced she might walk in at any moment. My fault for yelling, she said. If anything happens to her, it's my fault. Since she was just a kid, my sister had excelled at school. A promising future awaited her. Everyone said so. As for me, well, people told me to be nice to her as if I was destined to depend on her. When she broke the news that she wanted to be a journalist, my parents didn't take her seriously at first. You might as well become a haymonger if you are so desperate for a dead career. Don't expect us to support you if you can't take your education seriously. They were just trying to keep her on the right path, I'm sure, so that she wouldn't waste her talents. But what they didn't know was that this was the only path Allison had ever wanted to walk. Watching her talk about it, I was convinced that she could bring the fire back to journalism with her determination alone. Nothing could be truly dead with Allison around. They got into a big fight and Allison left. Like my parents, I assumed she'd be back once she cooled down, but she was gone. When the police informed us that they had found her phone and wallet in a ditch, they told us to prepare for the worst. Runaways often ditch their phone, but never their wallets, said an officer. From his voice, it was clear he wasn't expecting her to be found alive. It was after that conversation that I went for a walk to the protest of my parents, late at night in the rain. I felt sorry for them. All they had left now was a screw-up, and if they couldn't even have that, what then? Allison had left no clues on her social media, and none of her friends knew her whereabouts. She had just vanished without a trace. Yet, I felt that she was still out there somewhere. What sort of situation could Allison possibly fail to prepare for? She'd practiced self-defense for years and knew the details of hundreds of crime stories by heart. I imagined her to be working on this story right now, about her perfect escape. Just as I pictured myself reading her book, detailing it all, I noticed something. On the front porch of an old house was an expertly carved jack-o'-lantern looking incredibly lifelike. With the light flickering inside, it seemed almost like a soul, eager to escape to the great beyond. There were others. An old man with a bushy beard, a woman with wrinkles and a cigarette in the corner of her mouth, and a girl. From a distance, I couldn't quite make it out. The light inside was much brighter than in the others that the glow made the contours gently fade out. However, my gut told me I had to have a closer look. As I climbed the fence, I felt my purse rising considerably. This was like something Allison would do. Not me. I'd always been the sort of person to retreat to the kitchen at parties as I wouldn't have to deal with too many people at once. 
Now I was trespassing. And for what? Some pumpkins. The lights were off inside the house. Presumably the owners were out. There was no car in the driveway either. Still, once I was over the fence, I crawled over across the lawn. You can never be too careful. I stopped for a bit when I imagined the owner slamming the door open, shotgun in hand to find a stranger crawling across their property. They might take a shot at me out of plain fear. Well, the thought petrified me at first, I kept crawling when I gazed up at the porch and saw my suspicions confirmed. The girl carved into one of them looked exactly like Allison. There was no mistaking it. The face of my lost sister had been carved into this pumpkin. The expression on her face was one of anger. Now close enough to touch it, I felt a wave of terror wash over me. As I stared into her face, I had the feeling that she was there, staring back at me. Whoever carved this, I realized, knew exactly what Allison looked like. It was too perfect to have been made with a picture as reference. Also, she hadn't been angry in any of the pictures we had given to the press. Hopeful that someone would recognize her. Judging from the state of the pumpkin, it hadn't been long either. The others were in various stages of decomposition, soft and bulging, a sweet scent of rot emanating from them. So entranced was I that I never noticed the door opening up. A man with a salt and peppered five o'clock shadow and a weathered fleece jacket looked at the stranger on his porch and smiled. You like that one, don't you? Frozen and shocked, I wasn't able to get a single word out. He continued. Took me a while to carve that one. It's special to me, you know. My daughter. She passed away last spring. Allison had a twin. No. Even then, I'd know. This looks exactly like my sister. I said. The expression on his face changed. Barely. I couldn't work out what he was thinking. There's a man living a couple miles from here that's my splitting image. Friends often complain that I've walked straight past them on the streets and they just look confused when I tell them that's not me. That's Peter the Accountant. Seeing doppelgangers for the first time can be unnerving. Come in for a cup of tea and I'll show you some pictures of her thought about what Allison would do. Pictures. Well, if I saw pictures of someone who looked exactly like her, then I might believe in. It could just be a massive coincidence. But if he was lying, I looked back at the pumpkin. Allison, or this man's dead daughter, looked less angry than scared right now. It could just be the light. All right. I said and picked up the pumpkin. For comparison, I added. The man laughed and said, All right then. Inside, the smell was nearly unbearable. Apparently, the jack-o'-lanterns outside were just the fresh ones. Inside were a whole collection of rotten ones. Some looking more like puddles than anything else. Please excuse the mess. He said. After Jessica disappeared, my wife couldn't take it, and she left. I'm not much of a housekeeper, you see, and I don't get many visitors. If I knew you were coming, I'd have cleaned up the place. He brushed off some old newspapers from the couch and invited me to sit. Let me just find the album, he said, and left the room. I stared in the pumpkin in my hands, looking exactly like my overachieving sister. This time, however, she didn't seem to look into my eyes. Instead, she appeared to be gazing across my shoulders. 
I turned around to see a set of family photos hanging on the wall. One of the persons in the picture was definitely the owner of the house, but it must have been taken a long time ago. In all of them, he looked at least 20 years younger. Standing beside him were not a wife and a daughter, but two people I presumed to be his parents. An old man looking a bit like the owner, but with a great bushy beard. And an old woman with wrinkles and a stern expression on her face. They seemed somehow familiar as well, like I'd seen them somewhere before. Suddenly, I felt as if my spine had spontaneously turned into ice. These two, they were the faces on the other lanterns. It then occurred to me that might not be all that strange. If he'd carved the face of his daughter, why not his parents as well? It did fit the theme, yet why did he choose to make their expressions so... terrified? didn't make sense. That's not how you pay tribute to lost loved ones. That's an act of revenge. I decided I had to get out of there, and I was taking the lantern with me. Just as I was about to leave, the owner returned. Hang on, he said. I have the pictures right here. Sorry for taking so long. I'm not all that organized, you see. That's all right, my son. I just got a text from my parents and I have to go home. I'm sorry. Perhaps I'll be back later. You're not taking my daughter with you, are you? His tone of voice made it seem as if he were telling a joke. A punchline known only to himself. He stepped closer as I tried to open the door. It was locked, and worse, I couldn't see a door latch. This door wasn't meant to keep people from coming in. It was meant to keep people from escaping. The owner withdrew a carving knife from his pocket and let out a high-pitched laugh. I hope you aren't as much trouble as your sister. She really didn't want to stay here and keep me company, and she kept asking me all these questions. Turns out she had already figured out what I was doing, and yet she came here alone. She had noticed Pat's disappearing and managed to trace it back to me. She was working on a story, an expose. Unfortunately for her, she didn't even know half of it. Where is she? I said, tears streaming down my face. He laughed again. She's been right under your nose this whole time. I looked down at the pumpkin, at Allison's face, and I saw that her expression had changed once more. She looked frightened and stared deep into my eyes, as if pleading for me to escape. Then I noticed the decaying pumpkin spread across the room. Dogs and cats of various kinds. He had started with pets, then moved on to people. And my sister, my brilliant sister, had worked it all out. For a moment, I cursed her courage. Why did she have to come here all by herself? Why couldn't she at least ask me to accompany her? If she did, then she might still be. Don't worry, said the man as he approached me. I'll put you two side by side. He raised his carving knife, and as I braced myself for what would come next, the pumpkin in my hands exploded, its backside bursting onto the man. With a shrill scream, he dropped the knife and wiped burning hot wax off his face. I was left holding only the face, Allison's face. This time she appeared to be smiling. As fast as I could, I crouched down and grabbed the knife. I stuck it deep into his throat. 
He staggered back in shock and pulled it out. Blood gushed from the wound and he tried to stop it, but it was too late. And something strange happened. His skin seemed to turn a shade of orange. Little by little, he transformed until all that was left was a deformed, pumpkin-like mess on the floor with a crude imprint of his shocked face on the surface. Even his blood had disappeared. Only a brass key remained next to what was left of him. I picked it up, and sure enough, it fit into the lock. I still hold on to the knife and what's left of my sister. My parents believe I carved it myself. I've never had the courage to tell them. I'm not like my sister. People were right, though, that I depend on her. Even after all that, she was the one to save me. I've decided to become a journalist, even if I'll never be half as good as Allison. Her fire lives on inside me. I chose to post this story here because you never know if there are others out there. Even if you don't believe me, please keep my story in mind if you see a jack-o'-lantern out there that looks just a bit too realistic. Every other child in my seven-year-old son's class has been on the Hell's Train roller coaster at our local fun fair. He comes home from school every day with eyes like a puppy and the voice of an angel. Not a child that's prone to making a dash for it the second mine and his mother's back is turned. Lauren says you feel your whole tummy doing backflips. I took my innocent little boy in his imagination-packed eyes and I feel my stomach do a backflip of its own when I remember why he can never experience such joys. Lauren's just trying to sound cool, kiddo. I've heard it's not all that fun. I glance back at the TV, begging fate to take my son's attention. Daddy, are you scared of the hell train? My only child had no idea how many nights I've stared at the ceiling, wishing that the scariest thing in that fun fair was Hell's Train. I'd give up every limb I have to fear those dimly LED lit tunnels rather than the slapping sounds of bulky leather shoes bolting towards your cart when you go through them. I'd give away my car just to be terrified of the steep drops and not the whites and red faced mysteries that wave at you as you reach the bottom. I'd let my boy stay up all night if I knew he wouldn't have to hear those vile, manic screeches of laughter that I'm currently listening to at 2am on a Monday, next to my sleeping wife. This town looked so perfect when me and her mother moved here eight years ago. When she got pregnant, we just couldn't envision our little boy growing up in the industrial, run-down, working-class town that we'd been raised in. And we took to the internet to find a better family home. Many a night, she'd sit on the sofa, consumed by her laptop, shouting at the pros of any town that caught her attention. How about this? All good schools, a local college, beautiful areas, a fun fair in the summer, and only two hours away. I was sold. Everything pro my wife read that night rang true. The place was angelic. It was the things they didn't talk about that have led me to where I am today. When I brought up the demonic cackles that ripped the midnight silence up to our neighbors, I got the kind of laughter you'd get from a new colleague that didn't hear what you said about, hoped it was a joke. My wife said she inquired about it at her new job and she got similar, followed by a topic change. I forgot about them and slept through them after a few months. I only ever got a real answer once our son was one and we took him to the local fun fair to see what rides allowed babies with their parents. 
I swear to God, I thought they were animatronics at first. They just didn't move like humans. I watched a few of them approach families in the expected goofy manner we're all used to clowns doing. But they might as well have had a leprosy diagnosis on their foreheads by the way the parents reacted. Mothers screamed, fathers shielded their kids, and completely shifted their direction. Even the kids looked startled and awkward at their presence. The fun fair isn't exactly acres big yet, the place was littered with them. White faces and obnoxiously big red smiles smeared on them that stare at you like you're a city boy in a hillbilly village. Until they remembered what they're supposed to be doing. I tried ignoring them and avoided their gaze like they were beggars looking for change. My wife was too occupied with our boy, who seemed to be the focus of their attention. They escaped my memory for a second once we found a small, cartoonish-looking train that allowed babies to sit on their parents' lap throughout the slow and steady ride. But they dragged themselves right back into the forefront of my consciousness. Once the ride came to a halt and one of their faces, one of their evil, monstrous, smeared, smiling faces was right next to the cart window staring at my wife and our boy. I hurried my family off the ride and caught the attention of the young ride attendant guiding us towards the accent. Please tell me if I'm just a new father being paranoid, but why are the clowns here like, you know that she shot me a cold questioning look why are you asking me they don't work with us just ignore them i decided we'd seen enough of the fun fair i rushed my wife to the exit following the attendant's advice and ignoring the eerie stares i noticed that the faster we moved the more of them seemed to join the already gawking clown by the ride they all stared as I kept one hand on my wife's back, keeping her at the same pace as me as she pushed the stroller. Their jumpsuits were all different colors with different patterns, yet they all had the same sadistic grin and malicious fire in their eyes. That's when I heard it. That demonic cackle that no longer ripped the midnight silence but pierced the daytime peace. The other families at the fair fell silent as I cast one more glance back at the growing gang. I still don't know which was responsible, but they all looked capable of such an unnerving noise. No one in this town will give me any insight to what these things are or where they came from. We're not a town from a horror film. We're not cursed or anything, but kids go missing just like anywhere else. Only when they vanish here, they stay vanished, and a new clown in a new jumpsuit with new makeup stares at me as I walk past the fair on my way home from work. The cackles seem to echo louder when the missing posters are up, and I'm not putting my son's face on a telephone pole as long as I live. Well, are you? No, son. I'm not scared of the hell train. I sigh. What I'm scared of is them remembering him. If I ever take him back. I grew up in a small town with a population of about 9,000 people. It was a nice, sleepy place with nothing really remarkable about it. Well, some people would point to the local gourd growing contest and disagree with me, but I never thought there was anything special about where I lived. That was until I turned 13. But I think I had my suspicions far before then. It was when I was seven and watching something on television. I must have seen this show a million times before, but it was only then that it hit me that there was something off about every house I had ever seen on television. 
Namely, there was a door in front. Of course, now I realize that such a thing is perfectly normal, but not then. None of the residential houses in my town had a front door or a back door or any other kind of door leading outside for that matter. You're probably wondering how it was that we got out and in then. The answer was varied. Some people would just climb in through a window built for that purpose. A lot of houses had a fire escape. The kind you might see in places like New York City which could be lowered down so that people could climb up. The inside of our houses was normal enough. The doorways and doors inside, no problem. Just no doors were there leading right outside the house. If anyone came to visit, they'd knock on a window or ring a bell outside. Usually, we would leave a sign outside leading up to the front of the house telling people how they should announce themselves. Packages would usually be left below windows in case no one was home. The pizza delivery guy would tap on our window, and we'd open it to take the pizza and hand over the cash. This almost seemed very silly to you, but I had grown up like this and had never questioned it. Not to say that it was true for all buildings in town. Public buildings like the school and such did have doors, but not the houses where people lived. In addition, there was a rather strict curfew where everyone would go home by sunset. Again, I never really questioned the curfew given that it was just how I was raised. That was until I turned 13. Just like many teenagers, I began questioning many of the rules imposed upon me. However, I still stuck to the curfew given how strict our town was about it. That was, except for one night. A night I won't forget as long as I live. It all started with my friend Dan. Well, I remember the events of that night vividly. What led up to that night is kind of hazy. I think that Dan lost a bet, and as part of that, he had to stay in the school on a Halloween night past curfew. Either that, or it was a dare. Regardless of how it worked, Dan and I had been as thick as thieves, so I knew that I couldn't let him go do this alone. Now, well, curfew was enforced in my town rather strictly, it was generally okay if you were an hour or so late. Not so for Halloween. On that night, everyone, even the adults, went back home far before it became dark. As a matter of fact, we even did our trick-or-treating one day before, on October 30th. And that too while the sun was up. My house didn't have a fire escape, so my choice of an exit was a window on the ground floor. When my parents were busy with something in the kitchen, I gently slid it open and hopped out. It honestly surprised me just how easy it was to sneak out. Then again, now that I think about it, I feel guilty because it probably meant that my parents just implicitly trusted me that much. I landed on the ground lightly and slid the window so it was open just a crack for my return. I should have realized as I wandered around the streets and saw no one that this was a bad idea, but when I saw Dan, my resolve strengthened and we made our way to our school. You have the camera? I asked him. Yeah, he said with a grin. I had always thought that there would be police cars or the like patrolling the streets during the curfew to enforce it, but no. The streets were totally empty. It should have been a clear message to us that we should have turned around, but we were two boneheaded teenagers and thought nothing of it. The school itself had a strange haunting feel to it. It was not helped by the fact that this was Halloween night and the decorations everywhere leered at us. I knew there was no way that I'd have the courage to come here by myself if ever asked to. Man, who would have thought the day would come where we would sneak out of your house to go to school? 
I asked. Dan chuckled. He was rather famous for ditching school, but I was usually too chicken to join him. I was also kind of a bookworm and a teacher's pet, and I didn't want to miss out on school. Dan could usually drag me into almost anything. But that was one of the exceptions. That was part of why I wanted to be with Dan this night. I wanted to do something really crazy during my adolescent years. Come here. Dan said. The front door's locked, but I left a window open. The two of us were used to jumping into buildings through windows, and we found ourselves inside of an old classroom we had been in two grades prior. I was about to ask why he chose this one in particular, but then remembered that our new one was on the second floor. So what now? I asked as the two of us were inside. Dan turned on the camera and introduced himself. Yo guys, it's me, your boy Dan. And here we are at school, on Halloween night. He sum. His style was rather similar to old school YouTubers. You could maybe even imagine him adding in that you should like and subscribe at the end. So yeah, we're here. And just to prove that this was on Halloween, I'm leaving this here. He pulled out a pine cone, which he had painted blue. I'm going to put this on our desk to prove we were here. If anyone in the morning saw that, they would think it was some weird art project someone left. But anyone who saw that tape would know otherwise. Come on, Dan said, motioning for me to follow him upstairs. Now that I look back on the whole thing... It was odd that the door of our classroom wasn't locked and that we could just go wander around the place so easily. But thinking about it some more, it was obvious why they wouldn't bother locking it up because no one was stupid enough to break in. We went up the stairs and every single squeak and creak sent me nearly jumping out of my shoes. Dan shook his head as he saw me. He had nerves of steel. At least he did for now. The two of us walked into our classroom and set the pine cone on the table. Dan took out the camera to start talking to it again when I heard something very loud. Dan stopped talking as I peered out a window. I saw some shadowy figures nearing the school. Dan, we're being found out. Dan took a quick look as well and motioned for us to hide. I didn't notice it since I got only a quick glance outside, but the figures had very odd proportions. In other words, they were not human at all. But at the time, I had just assumed that our parents had come for us. Dan turned off his flashlight and also his camera. I turned off mine as well. After some whispering, we both decided to try and use the other set of stairs to get a room at the back of the school. If push come to shove, we could get outside through a window and sneak out behind the school. It was a bit harder maneuvering given that we weren't using flashlights. But as we heard the sound of footsteps, we quickened our paces. Here, Dan said while opening the door. Both of us ducked into a classroom and I began wiggling a window free so we could get out. Come on, Dan. Let's go. I told him. We had pretty much done enough risky things that night to become living legends among the class as far as I knew. So even if we hadn't technically spent the whole night at school, it was still cool. No one would look down on us. However, Dan seemed to be frozen in place for some reason. I tried shaking him and he just pointed out the other window into the hallway. I couldn't see his expression in the darkness, and all he did to acknowledge my prodding was to raise his flashlight and turn it on. One of those things was standing right outside the window. There is no other way for me to describe it other than a thing. It had to be about seven feet tall. It had a lower body which was mechanical. Its upper portion was wearing some sort of military coat 
and its head was smashed in and deformed. It only had one discernible eye which was focused on us. Dan screamed, his nerves of steel broken, and I grabbed his hand and had to almost practically drag him out the window. The two of us didn't look back as we raced back to our houses in half the time it had taken us to get there. Needless to say, my parents were both very worried and very pissed. Oh, I was punished extremely severely for what I had done. But when I told them the story about what I had said, both of them had horrified looks on their faces. The two of them whispered to each other, and my dad had told me a story. Normally, I'd tell you this when you turned 18, but now that you've seen one of them... What are they? I burst out. Calm down. We don't know. My dad explained. At some point during Cold War, our town was a testing ground for the military. They were trying to make a new kind of soldier, and it went wrong somehow, and they just left. But when those things began wandering the streets at night, and would burst into people's houses, knocking down the door no matter what it was made out of or how many locks you put on it, they could sense life and we couldn't hide from them in any reliable way. One or two people were injured, and many just disappeared after encountering them. We thought about abandoning the town, but, well, we found a way to deal with them. Whatever programming they had had a severe flaw. They couldn't find their way into places that didn't have a door. Seems like they wouldn't even identify it as a house, and so that's why we make houses like this. Why on Halloween, though? My dad shrugged. Some people say they were made using malevolent spirits and fusing them with technology at the time somehow, which is why they become more active on Halloween. But no one knows for sure. Maybe that's the reason they can't get in if there's no door. Perhaps the spirits or entity they're based on can only get in through a doorway. Anyway, they may or may not turn up on any given night, but they're always active on Halloween. You two are lucky to have escaped. After the explanation, there was a lot of yelling, and long story short, I was grounded for most of my teenage years. With all that said, our town isn't a bad place. It's really nice. Just in case you happen to visit, make sure to not stay around past night, especially if it's Halloween. Sometimes I think of the benefits of the alien occupation. I have free food water, and shelter. I have a machine that keeps the temperature cool the entire day, another that creates boiling water on the spot, and, well, I'm talking to people in other universes. Of course, that sounds like the words of a madman, so for simplicity's sake, just imagine I'm in another galaxy, or maybe timeline works better. Just know I'm very far from you. And no, I can't explain the technology. I'm a miner, not a scientist. Then I remember the drawbacks. That familiar slamming on my door. One I always think will break the glass, but never does. Once every four weeks, yet I still never expect it. I put down the cup of tea half of it having spilt out. If you don't drop everything immediately, they'll kick the door down. I open the door, seeing the familiar entourage of Athleen and her posse. She's my friend who comes to my house at least once a month. I met her during the initial invasion, almost a year ago. She was charismatic, though in a... Uh, 
I don't know an analogy you'd understand. Would dictator make sense? Sure, I'll go with that. Her red irises are just as piercing as ever. If you have anything illegal, declare it for amnesty, she says. Identical to every other visit. Her species hardly fits through my doorway. She stands almost 30 centimeters above me, which is still short compared to her soldiers. All of the soldiers wear helmets of an amorphous shape, with deep gray armor covering their entire bodies. They stand perfectly identical in height, width, shape, and every other quality. The medals and ribbons strewn to her coat and skirt jingle as she walks over to my native-grown tea. She pours it down the drain, telling me, Please use the government-provided tea. The squadron rummages through my entire pantry, throwing out my containers of homegrown food. Their provided substances was very nutritious, sure, but the taste was completely devoid of anything. I watch, leaning against the wall. If I even dare to complain, they'll throw me in prison. The entire floor is decimated by wounds made by their metal boots. I don't even try to repair them anymore. Athleen prances over to my bookshelf, checking every book for subject matter, and shaking them all for hidden notes of rebellion. As she does, she chucks them onto the couch in no particular order. I prefer them alphabetized. The bruises on my neck still pulse with paralyzing pain to this day. On one of these checks, I left the book Augusta the Pillager on the table. Actually, if I'm reaching the right universe, or galaxy. You don't know who that is. It's for the better. Her men grabbed me by the hair and struck me on the neck with the butt of their rifle. I assumed that's what they did. The instant they hit me, I was out. My hands were bound by cuffs. A soldier was standing beside me, holding my shoulder. Athleen was talking about something, or rather related to God and Augusta. All I know is the stench of paper lit ablaze, then of smoldering flesh. The shrieks of undeclared stowaways, of those who had refused assimilation. Right, that's why they are searching my house, for sentient non-human species. I never listened to their preachers and sermons, so I don't know the precise reasons why. One of her soldiers always stands on the other side of the dining table, his gun pointed directly at me. Apparently, he had never heard of trigger discipline, his finger in the trigger guard. I watched as Athleen's eye fluid drained away, and they grew out of her sockets. Visibly, the sensors switched. Athleen yelled to them in a foreign tongue, one she always spoke when addressing them. Simultaneously, she points to the kitchen. Protocol A7HA. With the swiftness of one line, they begin to tear apart the floorboards, ripping them with their hands. I try to slip away, but the observer raises his rifle, his left index finger shifting over to the safety. Don't try to escape, Inman. Inman is a slur for the non-Leonite human. You probably don't know what that means either. All you have to get is the Leonites think they are superior to all other life forms. The kitchen has wood chips splattered all over the sinks and counters. One of them feels the ground, sensing the heat radiating from the hot water container. False alarm. Athleen gazes around, rotating 360 degrees twice. She locks onto the bathroom, then points and yells the same phrase. Fuck. Athleen and the four march on over. I can hear them tearing the floor into pieces. God damn it, the bedroom was the hiding place. 
I never knew they had heat sensors. They had never checked that before. A shrill scream resounds throughout the entire home. The echoes of titanium fists hitting flesh. I ignore the soldier keeping watch. Get back here. He yells in the identical, staticky voice they all had. I rush to the bedroom, praying to every deity my wife is still hanging on. Just as I can see them wailing on her, striking her with impunity, my face grinds onto the floor, the weight of power armor resting on my spine. He steps on my pelvis and pulls my head back, curling my spine like a bow. Athlean drags my wife out of the room, smeared in blood, fur ripped out of the follicles, skin torn like paper. Those welts, craters of flesh, still stand so vividly in my memories. At this moment, she looked just like my father, brutalized by the savage invaders, deemed inferior and weak. That was how I met Athlean. A convoy of mechanized vehicles triumphantly stormed past the city entrance, easily bursting through the wooden gates. My father was part of the city guard, protecting the denizens. It was actually just him by then. Every other guard, when they heard the crackling sounds of machine gun fire, fled. She stood atop one of the tanks and declared something along the lines of, Hence, this city... Its populace, its possessions, everything within it is the sovereign territory of Emperor Augusta, ruled by the nation of the Augustan Holy Eagles Empire. My father, a brave but foolish soul, drew his sword. He had seen the assimilations earlier that morning. No, this city shall stand free from tyranny. We shall not bow to foreign powers. I admit your courage, but pity your stupidity. Athlean spoke with a piercing stare. But if you can defeat me in a duel, then your city shall become isolated from all the pleasures of life, but free nonetheless. She hopped down from her perch and marauded over to him. He took the first strike and swiftly drew in for a swing at her. Just as his arm came to bring a machine of death and murder down, she caught it. She caught it by the blade. She snatched it from his hand and he fell forward beneath her. With a single throw, the sword passed down for five generations sank into the river. His gaze of unadulterated terror was that of a doe watching the hunter release their arrow. A single stomp on his head split his helmet open like an egg. Picked up by his hair, he whimpered. Fine, fine. I lost. The city is yours. How dishonorable. The challenger in a duel should always, always fight to the death. She held him like a rag doll, slamming her fists into his chest, shaping his iron armor like clay. My feet were glued to the floor, my mouth agape, yet nothing came out. She tossed him into the back of one of the vehicles, before promptly leaving. The whole city was dead silent, as quiet as midnight, aghast staring at the splatters left behind. Now, another one so close to me befell such a fate. She pushes her bruised face into mine, yelling, this is what happens when you don't declare your crimes. Every time we give you amnesty. Every time you had the chance to avoid this. A hard strike to the back of my head sent me knocking into the floor again. Red rivers ran down my cheeks. The last thing I saw was my wife's tear-covered face. Smearing together with the blood. A droplet of water drips onto my head. My knees are planted in the mud. My hands tied together. I look up, seeing Athlean with an axe in her hand. Her topless back is smothered in deep scars, running like canyons through the faw muscles. 
Not even the most ferocious tiger could slice flesh like that. Her steel interior is visible through the trenches. As she turns, her front is drowned in an ocean of burns, scorched by the battles she's seen. My wife, Nirve, a Vulpine, laid with her arms sprawled against a cross. Vulpines all had fur, but hers were ripped out, the roots still bleeding. Her head pointed down, her body unable to support it. Her hands were chained to the crimson-stained wood. Athleen takes heavy, baited steps, keeping a gait so slow. Most would fall from how long their foot was in the air. Didn't have to be like this. You could have declared her, avoiding all of this. She wouldn't be bleeding out, scalped like a slave, and yet you chose not to. You chose a false sense of pride for your inferior people. You chose to let these consequences happen. She took a long pause. But don't worry. I'm giving you another chance to make a decision. Drawing a pistol from her pocket. This gun has two bullets. One for her, one for you. I will not stop any choice you make. She places the pistol just a few centimeters in front of me. I... I choose nothing. I'm not playing into this. If that's what you want, you'll leave your wife crucified and bleeding out, waiting to become a wolf's dinner. Then you'll get up and go back home, ready to live a life of modern luxury, of free food, free water free shelter. You'll abandon her after getting her in this situation. Faintly, I hear the whimpers of my wife begging to be let free. As Athleen stands above me like an obelisk, she drives the axe into the head wound, sending jolts of pain through my body, carving deep into my mind every second of it. I regret the memory enhancing chip where is your pride now? Why, when tortured and maimed, do you not have pride? Does a couple not die a couple? I desperately scramble for the gun, feeling a hard object in the soft mud. I raise it to my head, squeezing the trigger. I await the relief. A click. Again, I squeeze with all the remaining strength I have. Another click. With no relief. I may have been slightly dishonest. The gun was a test. Now you've shown your sins of cowardice and selfishness. You have shot yourself to end your torment, letting your wife fester and ferment. Your real choice is now whether to die in this field with her. Otherwise, I will take you to the hospital. You will return to your cushy life with everything except her. I drop the gun, splashing mud across me. I descend to a crawl like a baby to its mother, laying at the base of the crucifix. Quiet whispers fill my ears. Please, Elijah... Go on. Her former opera voice was hoarse and rough. I'm not leaving you, I say, coughing scarlet to cross the dirt. For once, exacerbated breathing stops her. In your life, listen to me. Taking an extended inhale, air clashing with liquid for space in my lungs. Athleen... I will leave. My bedroom light blinds me. I feel the back of my head, only finding my bald spot. A nightmare, I wonder. Nirve had always got up before me. It was no surprise she wasn't in bed. I look around my room. No, I didn't have the carpet before. It was wood, so I could easily remove it and see my wife. 
God damn it. Nervais actually gone. I left her. I left her to rot. Athleen was right about my cowardice, about my selfishness. It is not a couple's dream to die together, to not make the other long for them after their death. Maybe I'll go back to bury her. Maybe bury myself as well. If I can even find the cross. For all I know, she brought us to another universe and crucified her there. Sitting at home in my rocking chair, an empty one to my left, I write this. I don't know if I will be here for the next inspection. I'm not sure if that's because I'll be dead or I'll be missing. Maybe both. Their eyes are etched into my mind. Athleen's emotionless and unblinking, dyed red hues from the torture she has brought. Nerves of depression, maintaining the little life she had in her. I am Elijah Coldshield, and I implore every single person reading this, that when they inevitably invade your world, comply and let them assimilate you. Otherwise, you will have your Athleen, and they will tear everything from you if you don't obey. Translated from Natiha 1280 to English 2020, using the Augustan official translation system, posted on pre-solar internet forum using Augustan official civilian broadcasting system, Authorized by the Natiha People's Council. This happened 12 years ago, and to this day I still consider myself lucky. The morning was cool as we loaded into the ambulance heading to a call at the edge of town. It was 6.12 a.m. and it was still dark outside. We were called in by the police station saying that there were multiple wounded and a few dead at what seemed to be a farm. We didn't actually know what caused the injuries, but we made our way to the scene. The address took us to a dirt road that led us to a home that had two police cars outside with their lights on but we didn't see any officers post in. There was no one there. The home was attached to the farm that seemed to be either deserted or just really old, but my main focus was on the cop cars out front. Typically, when they were called to a scene, there is at least a police officer guiding us to where we needed to go, but there was no one. A situation like this could be dangerous, we could be heading into danger and not know it. The home's front door was open, but there weren't any lights on. There seemed to be blood on the front porch that led into the house. Having been in the field for 18 months, I was pretty hardened by multiple calls with car crashes and even a triple homicide. But something about this call was different. For the first time being on call, I was actually afraid. I decided that rather than just sitting around, that we should enter the home and try to find the injured people. I slowly entered the home with a flashlight and a medical bag. The blood that was on the porch led into the home and up the stairs. I made my presence known, but I got no response. I tried the lights, but they didn't work. What was this place? As I searched the bottom floor clues, I started to hear muffled sounds coming from upstairs. It sounded like something very heavy being dragged across the floor. The other paramedics that were now with me also heard the sounds upstairs, but they also seemed to feel scared. We heard the dragging sounds continue upstairs, slowly moving to the top stairs. Not thinking, I began to walk to the stairs to see if there was anyone there. 
The blood on the stairs was thick, and it made it slippery since the floors were made with wood. I shined my light to the top of the stairs, having no idea what to expect. I slowly continued forward with the other paramedics behind me. We were halfway up the stairs when we saw a hand pull forward. A policeman who was on the ground. He continued to drag himself on the ground, revealing that his lower half was missing. Get out of here before it sees you. He said with extreme pain. My medical training must have kicked in as I ignored his warning and I rushed to his aid at the top of the stairs. At the top of the stairs, I could see what remained of the officer and the trail of blood that he produced that came to another set of stairs leading to what appeared to be the attic. The two paramedics that were with me attended to the officer at the top of the stairs and I ventured slowly to the stairs of the attic. Above me, I could hear sounds that I'm not able to describe, but they were terrifying in nature. Sounds that I assumed to be grunts or something very large eating. My flashlight was the only thing illuminating my path in the long hallway leading to the attic stairs. The hallway was long and unfurnished. I could see scratches on some of the walls and floors, although blood covered most of the floor. I had no idea what was happening here, or, more importantly, what was still happening. But I assumed due to the blood and lack of personnel at the scene that there were many that still required my help, although the scene was most likely dangerous. I've experienced violence before while on duty. Many people, while in shock, can be aggressive and numb to pain while making subduing them quite the task. I wasn't necessarily preparing for violence, although it's never outside the realm of possibility. I proceeded the attic steps alone, flashlight in hand. I was tempted to announce my presence, but I decided against it. I had a feeling that I never experienced before, but the best way I could describe it was that I was about to meet the devil. The literal embodiment of evil was up these stairs. I walked up the stairs, slowly hearing sounds much clearer. Sounds that didn't sound good. I was about to reach the top of the stairs when I heard a loud sound coming from downstairs and a rushing of people entering the home. I quickly turned around and ran down the stairs over to the other paramedics and the officer that was in grave condition. Coming up the stairs was a SWAT team in full gear. This would be the first and last time I'd ever see a SWAT team come to a scene. They ordered us all downstairs and told us to leave the officer. The officer was bandaged but unresponsive due to blood loss. They asked me, where is it? Sternly, and I pointed to the attic stairs. They rushed to the stairs leading to the attic with their weapons drawn, and we went down the stairs. From the bottom floor, we could hear screeching and gunfire coming from the attic. A lot of gunfire. We were ushered outside by more members of the SWAT team. By this time, the sun was starting to rise, and not only did the SWAT team arrive, but also government officials in suits. They pulled us aside and asked us questions. They asked us what we saw and who was all inside. Thankfully, we hadn't seen much, so we told them the truth. I asked them, what was going on? What was inside? They didn't answer me, and they told me to attend the people that they'll be bringing out. They brought out seven bodies that day. Seven mangled bodies. None of them fully intact, however, the one officer missing both legs ended up surviving. What happened here? What did they shoot in the attic? What was I about to see in the attic that had the SWAT team not arrived? I'm glad that I wasn't one of those bodies.
I'm somewhat of an experienced outdoorsman. From a young age, I've loved to fish and hike, and more recently have gotten into firearms, hunting, and shooting. Over my 20 years, I've picked up some good tips and tricks for those of you who might be going camping, hunting, fishing, whatever. I'm from the Midwestern US, and that's where I've spent most of my time off the beaten path. I've had some weird experiences far in the woods. Far from any named road with nothing but my Ruger and a flashlight. Most of this shit I had to learn myself, so I wanted to share what I've learned with you all. This will be a numbered list with a short explanation for most. Zero. Yes, rule zero. And that's because it's the most important rule. Carry a fucking gun. I know many of you probably can't due to age or where you live, but if at all possible, carry a firearm. Preferably a primary firearm and a backup. Your primary firearm should be able to drop any large game in your area with one shot. A 308, a 306, a 7.62 by 54R. A 4570 government and any other larger rifle cartridges will serve this purpose well for you. For a sidearm, I'd recommend something chambered in 45 ACP or 10mm. Game wardens have been carrying 10mm clocks in many parts of the US because, believe it or not, a 10mm packs enough punch to take down a bear with well-placed shots and well-placed mag dumps. Become competent with your firearm and know how every part works. 1. Never, ever, under any circumstances should you ever panic. Do whatever you need to do to keep your wits about you. 10 deep breaths, a prayer, literally anything. But should you ever find yourself in a situation where you will need to depend on yourself to survive... I don't mean finding shit to eat if you get lost or anything like that. I mean having to flee from something that wants to hurt you, or have others with you who are depending on you. Panicking will get you killed or worse. 2. Hiking, hunting, fishing, camping, etc. With someone, never let them out of your sight. There have been many, many documented cases of someone turning around to look at something, then turning back and their partner is gone. If you want to learn more about this shit looking into missing 411, many people go missing after being out of sight for literal seconds and are never found. Or sometimes their clothes are found neatly folded on top of a boulder 10 miles away up a mountain 10 years later. Or similarly, impossible circumstances. 2. Sub rule for number 2 because it's related. Not to sound like an asshole, but if you're going to bring someone with you, make sure that they trust you and can follow directions to the letter, and without hesitation should the need arise. 3. Pay attention to what you hear. Specifically, what you don't hear. What do I mean by that? Well, don't get so drawn into the beauty of nature that you neglect to be mindful of your surroundings. Especially sound. Especially lack thereof. Should you ever find yourself deep in the woods and notice that the sounds of nature around you have stopped? No more skittering squirrels. No more noisy-ass fucking bugs. No more distant howling or barking or anything. There is something in your vicinity that the animals around you do not want to be aware of their presence. If that ever happens, I highly recommend turning around and going back the way you came, at a steady and measured pace. Do not run. Do not scream. Do not allow your breathing to become particularly panicked. Basically, keep your shit together and get the fuck out of there. Because if the animals all around you were smart enough to do so, follow their example. 4. Should you smell roses or copper out of nowhere, say loudly but firmly and calmly, I have a right to be here. Should the smell persist, it should be wise to go back the way you came. 
again at a quick but measured pace, and don't run or show signs of panic. Aside from persistence of the smell, should pebbles or rocks be thrown at you from an unseen location, go back the way you came, but now it's fine to run and you probably want to make sure you have a round in the chamber while doing so. 5. If you smoke cigarettes, good. Smoke a cigarette or a pipe while you walk. Smoke protects. 6. Stay away from boulder fields. Many people go missing in boulder fields. 7. Psalm 23, 4. Should I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. 8. Walking along a river or stream. Take a step away from it every half mile or so. Make your presence known. Hum a tune or sing a song. Sing a march or think out loud. Just make your presence known and remember that you have a right to be there. 10. Know the folklore of your local area, or that of wherever you're in the woods, specifically the Native American folklore. And you can compound this by further studying reports of European explorers in that area. The natives would have been there for such a long time that they would have incorporated any beings, spirits, whatever you can want to call them, into their beliefs and folklore. By studying later accounts of Europeans, you can see what happens when one unfamiliar with or downright disrespectful or fearful towards whatever inhabits that area is present. 11. These things all kind of go hand in hand. Carry a steel water bottle. If you're ever outside of your tent at night, do so with a yellow light in hand. And keep dried garlic in your backpack. 12. Possibly the second most important rule here. Respect nature. No hippie shit, but don't litter. Leave the berries for the birds. Respect the trees and so forth. Leave an area as you found it, and if you have to take anything, do so with utmost gratitude and respect for nature's provision. You may also leave an offering of food or tobacco if so inclined. 12b. Think no evil. Speak no evil. Do no evil. Come with good intentions, and harm is much less likely to befall you. 13. If you ever feel an unexplainable, almost implanted, as if it wasn't your thoughts or idea, urge to move away from your group, you must ignore and fight that desire with all of your willpower. 14. Before you go telling me I'm a piece of shit for this, just keep reading. This is its own rule, but it's also the elaboration I spoke on earlier. If you hear someone calling for help, especially at night, think very fucking carefully about whether you want to go out there to help them. Because it isn't guaranteed that whoever or whatever is calling for help really needs it, and isn't just trying to lure you in. Could be a cracky in the woods trying to rob you. Could genuinely be someone in distress. But it could also be something deliberately mimicking a human voice. Only a human voice that it's heard before. Only words and phrases that it has heard before to lure you as well. In this situation, I recommend notifying police and or a national park slash state slash whatever relevant authorities. It is not your responsibility to help someone. I hope this has been informative and I would love to answer any questions you may have. Apologies for any formatting issues, as I am on mobile. Stay safe out there, folks. Hello. I'm writing this because, as it may be clear by the title, I'm in desperate need of a capable surgeon. 
I'll write down here the first informations. If I caught your attention, you can read further, and then, after a private chat, we can arrange something for the first surgery. This is a twice-per-year job, approximately every six months, but sometimes I could be needing your services before the usual time. Or after, if we're lucky. The payment will be divided. I'll give you half the amount before the surgery, and the other half will be delivered directly to your home. I'll be paying a total of $350,000 per surgery. I will need you to stay at my habitation for the week before the surgery. Monitoring my data with the necessary equipment I'll be providing. One or two days after the surgery, you can return to your life. I won't contact you until the next surgery, or in the unlucky situation in which I need your immediate assistance. During the surgery, it is extremely important that you are willing to euthanize me if the situation gets too dangerous for both of us. All of this is an essential thing for me, and it could even become dangerous if you don't keep this in total secrecy. I'm not expecting from you any kind of questions that are not strictly tied to the medical information needed to perform the surgery, and every kind of data and information will stay exclusively in my possession. I will be giving you a text with all the technical informations about the surgery on our first meeting. If you're still reading at this point, I'll suppose that you don't have any kind of problem with the terms I've listed before. If that's the case, read carefully the next informations and conditions to see if you are willing to accept the job. During your permanence at my house the week prior to the surgery, you will have your own rooms that function independently to the rest of the house. For safety reasons, you will have the only pair of keys to the part of the house, and you must lock all the doors during the night. Do not, under any circumstance, exit your rooms when there's no sun outside, no matter the time of day. Do not intervene even if you hear screaming in pain, no matter what you hear. Please, regardless of your religion or creed, do not remove the Bible, the cross, and any other religious symbols from your rooms when and if you find them. It will probably happen that you will have to retrieve pieces of flash that I've lost during the day or during my night walks. Those pieces have to be stored and analyzed every morning and every evening. Before going to sleep, you will have to change my bandages after soaking them in sterile solution. In the last days right before the surgery, you may have to do this more times per day. The more my condition gets worse, the more I need to be heavily sedated. This means that in the last days, I will need you to feed me. This will happen with tube and funnel, since probably I will have already lost my lips tongue, and parts of my throat. My food has to be a mixture of one kilogram per meal, three parts salt, four parts raw meat, two parts chlorine, and one part sulfur. If you injured yourself during one of these procedures, apply a heavy amount of salt and alcohol to the wound and stay locked in your rooms until you stopped losing blood. If this happens too fast, or if you feel pain to the bones near the wound, we will discuss what to do next. During the last days before the surgery, I won't be surely of any company. If you feel bored or stressed, feel free to listen to some music. This may be relaxing for me, too. The surgery must be done the eighth day after your arrival at 3 a.m. You will be alone during the procedure. During the surgery, be sure to remove every single bone in excess from my body. I trust that you, as a surgeon, will be able to identify them. Clean all the abscesses and check regularly my heartbeat. If it seems too abnormal and if I regain consciousness no matter the sedatives, proceed with the lethal injection. If you have to proceed with the injection, you will only have three hours to call the number in my office under the name Hemlock. Tell him what happened. 
he will arrive as fast as possible. In the meantime, but my body in the cremation room and prepare it at maximum heat. When Hemlock comes, leave the house. You will receive the rest of the payment. If the procedure goes well, your only and last obligations to me will be checking that my functions are in the norm. I won't be needing help to feed and all the other things listed before. I'll be the one telling you to return freely to your house. Return the keys to your rooms before leaving. The second part of the payment will arrive directly at your house in the ten days after the surgery. Thanks for reading the advertisement. If you have any kind of questions, I'll try to answer. If they don't violate too much of my privacy or the nature of this situation. In the 1980s, my father took my mom, me, and my two younger siblings on a trip from Anchorage to Fairbanks on the remote Route 3. My dad was a deeply spiritual person and always felt the need to ensure that everyone was doing okay, to include complete strangers. He came close to becoming a Catholic priest but opted out of it because he wanted more to have a family. I remember driving in the rented station wagon and Dad stopping because he saw a cabin with a man out front. Dad asked the man if everything was okay and the man really never responded to my dad, other than shaking his head yes. Dad then asked the man if he lived in the cabin by himself and the man shook his head yes again. I don't know the exact age of the man because I was only 12 years old at the time but I would say he was in his 40s. Dad sensed something was wrong in how the guy wouldn't answer my father's questions. Dad asked him specifically how long he lived in the cabin, and the man shrugged his shoulders like he had no clue. The only word the man stated was Oklahoma when my dad asked where he was from. However, when my dad followed up with how and why he was in Alaska... The guy once again shrugged his shoulders like he had no clue how he got to Alaska or why he was there. Dad was always eager to save people and tell them about the Bible, but even my dad could sense something didn't seem right about the situation. The unknown man seemed to shut down when my dad asked what he did for a living or how he was able to feed himself to the point where the man walked into the one-room cabin and shut the door. I remember specifically my dad rubbing his head in a manner where he wasn't sure if he should find a payphone to call the police or them to do a welfare check. My dad got back into the station wagon and he stopped again a few miles up the road when he saw a female in front of her cabin. The really odd thing was that she responded exactly in the same mannerisms as the first man did and the only words she said was, Tennessee, when Dad asked where she was from. I could still recall the look of bewilderment on the woman's face when Dad asked how and why she got to Alaska. She, too, ended the interaction by walking back to her cabin and closing the door. Dad did this four more times on the trip, where he would see a cabin and stop to talk to the people. Every single one of the people were living in these cabins most likely by themselves and each one of them only responded where they were from. The last man said he was from New York and eventually closed his cabin door like the others did. Dad didn't utter one word about the Bible to any of the people he met because he genuinely sensed something wasn't right with how all of the people he met acted really bizarre. Dad was talking to mom in the car about them possibly being POWs from Vietnam or the Korean War, because they only stated the state they were from. Mom didn't agree with that because she said there weren't too many female POWs, and she thought the people didn't give off any military vibes. Dad eventually came across a police barracks that was no bigger than the single-room cabins that we had seen along Route 3. After talking to the Alaska trooper, 
Dad seemed like he was really upset because the trooper basically told my father to mind his own business. Because the people didn't wave him down in distress asking for help. These encounters bothered me so much that I took my family back to Alaska on Wednesday. Where we did the same trip from Anchorage to Fairbanks along Route 3. The spooky thing was that all the cabins were still there. However, they were all empty besides one. I knocked on the cabin door and I was immediately taken aback in time where the same man who said he was from New York answered the door. The man didn't look like he aged significantly, and this time I was determined to get answers. I looked the guy straight in the eyes and asked him the same questions of how and why he got to Alaska, and there was the same blank expression, where once again he shrugged his shoulders. He once again closed the door on me like he did to my father. This follow-up trip to Alaska did nothing more than creep me out, more so than when I was 12 years old. I wish I hadn't looked into the man's eyes because I'll never forget the intensity and the overall fear that the man personified when I was asking him those simple questions. I was grateful that my kids were playing with their electronic devices, where they didn't even pay attention to the man from New York. My wife and I were trying to make sense of the empty cabins and the man from New York where my wife was convinced that the guy hadn't interacted with anyone since the encounter with my dad in the late 1980s. We were stumped because there wasn't a driveway or any tire tracks that led to that guy from New York's cabin, which made us rule out that there weren't any charitable organizations making stops with food because there was no tire tracks anywhere to be seen. My wife didn't believe that the guy was from New York, and she was convinced that someone had brainwashed him to say that, but fell short on instructing the man on what to say besides New York. My mind seems lost when trying to finalize the meaning of the man in the vacant cabins, where I had a nightmare last night, where my mind just made up a story about the people in the cabins to try to find closure, but my mind still hasn't found the closure to this day. I don't want to leave Alaska until I find the truth, but my wife is practically terrified. What if those people died in those cabins and have been sitting there for years? I said to my wife. That's not your concern. Our concern is with us and our kids. But the not knowing part will always haunt me like it did when we came here in the 1980s. I'll tell you one. If you really want to help someone... Then I'll start the process of fostering a child, or we can volunteer at the homeless shelter. Honey, you saw that man from New York. What if that was me or your father? Wouldn't you want someone to at least make sure that nothing suspicious was going on? Well, he's not you or my father. If that is the same man from the 1980s, then he should be well into his 70s, where the man was no older than 50-something. What are you saying? That was a different man from New York, or are you saying he hasn't aged? I'm saying I just want to go back on the plane with you and the kids and go home. Besides, those creepy cabins, Alaska was beautiful and I just want to leave it at that. I thought we were here to see Denali National Park. I didn't realize that the focal point of this trip was to figure out the meaning of those hermits. You know that we are all just one bad mistake from a cataclysmic occurrence. Just say, for example, that me and the kids were killed in a car accident and you were left alone. Don't you think you would likely become more apt to be preyed upon? Move in with my parents. That's because you're fortunate enough to have parents. What is your obsession with those cabins? To be honest, who really cares about them? It's just something that left a lasting impression on me when I was here back in the 80s. It's the same feeling if you saw a father slapping his kid around and feeling regretful that you didn't do anything to stop it. Stop. Those people in those cabins were adults and not kids. Exactly. Everyone would be more willing to stop and help a kid, but adults are more castaways in the most people's eyes. They're not castaways. They're adults, and most adults have the ability to fend for themselves. Unlike children, my wife says... 
Adults who are of a straight mind can fend for themselves. You remember your friend Mandy whose husband died and she refused to get out of bed for weeks until the police stepped in and brought her to a psychiatric institution? You're assuming that those people in the cabins are the victims. What if they're being punished for something? Like what? Maybe they... Renegade on a bet or cross the wrong person. Then they should go to jail or something. I don't think jail operates that way. My wife says to me. I'm going back. I'll never stop thinking about those cabins unless I find the answers. I'll tell you what. Why don't you look at your kids and ask yourself what's more important? Those cabins or us and the kids? I stand at the door of our hotel, not sure what to do. Because I know if I don't find the answers to those cabins, then the nightmares will haunt me for the rest of my life. I stand there for a few minutes and I come to the conclusion that coming back to Alaska will be slim to null. So if I don't do it now, then I'll never find the answers. I hug both of my kids and reach out to hug my wife, but she pulls away. I'm sorry, but for the past 30 years, I've been haunted by those cabins. So if I leave now, then the nightmares will never end.